Welcome to our latest video, which has the title more about Gibbs free energy. By the end of this video lesson, you should have an improved understanding of the concept of Gibbs free energy changes and how these are calculated. You should also be able to explain how Gibbs free energy can identify whether reactions are feasible or not, and be able to calculate the minimum temperature when a reaction becomes feasible. Now in our previous video lesson, we learned that chemical reactions will occur spontaneously if the Gibbs free energy delta G value is negative. And if the Gibbs free energy delta G value is positive, the reaction will not occur spontaneously. Now if a reaction does have a positive delta G value at a particular temperature, change in the temperature may result in the delta G value becoming negative and a reaction becoming feasible. And in our previous video lessons, we've learned that delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S where delta G is the change in Gibbs free energy, delta H is the change in enthalpy, T is the temperature in Kelvin, and delta S is the entropy change. Now enthalpy changes are normally expressed in kilojoules per mole, and entropy changes are normally expressed in joules per Kelvin per mole. So when you use this equation, it's really important that the energy units that you use for delta H and delta S are the same. So as we saw in our previous video lesson, what normally happens here is that you convert the delta S value, the entropy value, from joules per Kelvin per mole to kilojoules per Kelvin per mole by dividing by a thousand. And then the energy units will both be kilojoules for both delta H and delta S. Now some reactions are feasible at some temperatures but not others. And the temperature when the reaction becomes feasible is when the value of delta G changes from positive to negative. In other words, when delta G is equal to zero. Therefore, we can use this value to find the temperature above or sometimes below which a reaction becomes feasible. Now, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. And if we put a value of delta G equal to zero, zero is equal to delta H minus T delta S, and delta H is equal to T delta S. Now if I rearrange delta H is equal to T delta S, I get T temperature equal to delta H divided by delta S. Now it's important to note that if the entropy and enthalpy values are both positive, the temperature value T that you calculate in this equation is the temperature above which a reaction becomes feasible. So if, for example, you had a value of T equal to 495, and your delta H value and your delta S value were both positive, that would mean that the reaction would become feasible above 495 Kelvin. Now, if the enthalpy and entropy values are both negative, the temperature value that you calculate T is the temperature below which a reaction becomes feasible. So if I had a negative delta H value, a negative delta S value, and I calculated my value T, and it was 495, that means below 495, the reaction is feasible. Now it's also worth mentioning that you will only ever use this equation, T equals delta H over delta S, when either both the entropy and enthalpy values are positive, or both the enthalpy and entropy values are negative. Because when they're not both positive or both negative, you won't need to work out a temperature when the reaction is feasible, because the reaction will either be feasible at all temperatures, or won't be feasible at all. Now this comes down to what we discussed in our previous video, that if you have a negative delta H value and a positive delta S value, the reaction is feasible at all temperatures. And if you have a positive delta H value and a negative delta S value, the reaction is never feasible. It's not feasible at any temperature. So to test your understanding of this, we're now gonna go for a worked example. So if you'd like to have a go at this question first, pause the video, read for the question, have a go at it and then we'll go for the answer.
So this example calculation asks you to determine the temperature in degrees Kelvin above which the following reaction will occur, given that the reaction has a delta S value equal to 160.4 joules per Kelvin per mole, and the delta H value here is 178 kilojoules per mole. So delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. And to work out this temperature, I'm going to make delta G equal to zero. So zero is equal to delta H minus T delta S. That allows me to rearrange this equation. So T is equal to delta H divided by delta S. Now the problem here is that delta H is in kilojoules per mole and delta S is in joules per Kelvin per mole. So I have to convert delta S into kilojoules per Kelvin per mole. And to do this, I divide by a thousand. So 160.4 divided by a thousand is 0 0.1604 kilojoules per Kelvin per mole. So then I'm just going to put these values into my equation. So the temperature is equal to 178 divided by 0 0.1604. Now, when I put these numbers into the calculator, 178 divided by 0 0.1604 comes out to be 1,109.7 Kelvin. I round up and it's 1,110 Kelvin. Now, because delta H and delta S were both positive values, this means that the reaction becomes feasible above 1110 Kelvin. So now let's test your understanding with some practice questions. So here's the first practice question. Read for the question, pause the video, have a go at it, and then we'll go for the answer. So this first practice question says, determine the temperature in degrees Kelvin above which the following reaction will occur, given that the reaction has a delta S value equal to 174.8 joules per Kelvin per mole, and the delta H value here is 100.6 kilojoules per mole. So delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. I'm going to give delta G a value of zero. So zero is equal to delta H minus T delta S. I rearrange this so that T temperature is equal to delta H divided by delta S. Now my delta S value is in joules per Kelvin and my delta H value is in kilojoules per mole. So I have to put the delta S value into kilojoules per Kelvin per mole. So I do this by dividing by a thousand so it's 174.8 divided by 1,000, which is equal to 0.1748. And that would be kilojoules per Kelvin per mole. So I'm now going to put these values into the equation. So the temperature is equal to the delta H value, which is 100.6 divided by 0.1748 which is the value of entropy in kilojoules per Kelvin per mole and that comes out if I do 100.6 divided by 0.1748 as 575.51 Kelvin so if I round up it's 576 Kelvin so from this answer I can conclude that the reaction is feasible at temperatures above 576 Kelvin. And it's above this temperature because the delta S value and the delta H value were both positive. Now our second practice question comes in two parts. Here's the first part. So read for the question, pause the video, have a go at it, and then we'll show you the second part of this question.
So here's the second part of this question. So once again, read for the question, pause the video, have a go at it, and then we go for the answers to part one and part two. So in the first part of this question, we have a chemical reaction involving carbon monoxide and steam. And it says, explain using a calculation why this reaction should not occur at 1300 Kelvin. Well, to find out why it should not occur, I need to work out the value of delta G at this temperature. So delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. So my delta H value is minus 41 kilojoules per mole. So I'm going to put that into the equation. So it's going to be minus 41 minus the temperature, which is 1300 Kelvin, times my delta S value. Now my delta S value is minus 42 joules per Kelvin per mole. However, my delta H value is in kilojoules per mole. So I have to convert my delta S value to kilojoules per Kelvin per mole. So I do this by dividing by a thousand. So my delta S value is going to be minus 42 divided by a thousand, which is going to be minus 0 0.042 kilojoules per Kelvin per mole. So I'm going to put that into the equation. So delta G is going to be equal to minus 41 minus 1300 times minus 0 0.042 so that comes out as minus 41 minus minus 54.6 the two minuses mean it's a plus so it's minus 41 plus 54.6 so that gives me a delta g value equal to plus 13.6 kilojoules per mole now remember the units for delta g are always the same as delta h so my delta G value is a positive value. So that means at 1300 Kelvin, the reaction is not feasible because reactions are only feasible if delta G is negative. I have a positive value. So it means at this temperature, 1300 Kelvin, the reaction is not feasible. So there's three marks for this question. Two marks for getting the correct value for delta G and one mark if you said delta G is positive, so the reaction is not feasible at this temperature. So part two is asking me to explain how the conditions for the reaction could be changed to allow this reaction to take place. So delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S, and I'm going to make delta G equal to zero. So zero is equal to delta H minus T delta S. And if I rearrange this, I have T, the temperature in Kelvin, equal to delta H divided by delta S. Now my delta H value is in kilojoules per mole, and my delta S value is in joules per Kelvin per mole. So I have to put my delta S value in kilojoules per Kelvin per mole. So I'm going to divide this by a thousand. So it's minus 42 divided by a thousand, which is equal to minus 0. 0 0.042 kilojoules per Kelvin per mole. So if I put these values into the equation, the temperature T is equal to minus 41, which is the delta H value, divided by minus 0 0.042. Now this will give me a temperature value equal to 976.2 Kelvin. So if I round this down, it's 976 Kelvin. Now, because the delta H value is negative and the delta S value is negative, this means that the reaction is feasible at temperatures below 976 Kelvin. And it's below because both delta H and delta S values here are negative. So this is a two mark question. So you get one for getting the right temperature, 976 Kelvin, 
and one mark if you said the reaction is feasible at temperatures below 976 Kelvin. And this is because the delta G value would be negative at temperatures below 976 Kelvin. So that concludes this video lesson. So after watching this video, you should now have an improved understanding of the concepts of Gibbs free energy changes and how these are calculated. And you should also be able to explain how Gibbs free energy can identify whether reactions are feasible or not and be able to calculate the minimum temperature when a reaction becomes feasible. So that concludes our video. Please check out our YouTube channel, Dr. Rowe Chemistry, and our Twitter site, which contains lots of chemistry information and links at Radar Chemistry.